Welcome to the Block Crunch Podcast, the show for crypto natives. Every week, we do short but in-depth conversations with the most important builders and investors in crypto, so you can filter through what's noise and stay ahead of the markets. I'm your host, Jason Choi. Nothing on this show should be construed as financial advice, and my guests, myself, and my employer may hold positions and assets discussed on the show. This week, I'm very excited to have Jeremy Allaire, the co-founder and CEO of Circle, on the show. Now, for the few of you who may not be aware, Circle is the company behind the stablecoin USDC, which currently has a market cap of $3 billion with over $400 million traded per day and with more enterprise adoption coming on. And I see USDC as one of the most important bridges between the crypto world and the traditional finance world. And Jeremy is going to come onto the show to talk about exactly what that means, what are some tactics that enabled him to bootstrap USDC to where it is today, his thoughts on how USDC fits in a world where we have central banks starting to issue their own digital currencies. And most interestingly, we also touch on Jeremy's personal background as a dot-com founder back in the 1990s, um, all the way to currently running a company like Circle. So there's a lot of interesting tidbits and valuable tactics that we describe that I think if you are a founder or someone who's trying to build something in crypto, this is going to be an unmissable episode. So once again, I'm incredibly excited to share this episode with you. But before we dive into it, here is a message from our sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by the good folks from Nexo. In this crisis, many investors aim to keep and grow their digital assets. Others seek to maximize the yield on their cash. Nexo allows you to achieve exactly these two goals. The company offers instant crypto credit lines against all major cryptocurrencies with interest rates starting from only 5.9% APR. Nexo also lets you earn up to 8% annually on your fiat and digital assets. What's more, interest is paid out daily. That means you can add or withdraw your funds at any time. So get started today at nexo.io. All right, super excited to have Jeremy Allaire, co-founder and CEO of Circle on the show. So welcome to the show, Jeremy. Thank you, Jason. It's really a pleasure to be on. Awesome. So Jeremy, you are the co-founder of Circle, but prior to that, you had a very storied career, which isn't as widely discussed in your recent crypto interview. So I thought I'd maybe give it a shot and give some color here for our listeners. So you started Allaire Corporation during the early dot-com boom, which resulted in an IPO in 1999. And subsequently, you also took another company, Brightcove, which is an online video platform public in 2012. And then after that, you started Circle, which is a crypto company, which most people in crypto know you for. So can you tell us, you know, how did that winding path in technology from the traditional, quote unquote, traditional tech world, Mm -hmm. how did that lead you to the crazy world of crypto today? Yeah, I mean, what's interesting about it is that um, there, there have been really consistent themes that have animated my interest in the internet um, and, and and all of the products and, and businesses and others have, have sort of been kind of pulling on the same thread, if you will. Um, and, uh, and actually, a lot of the things that motivated me in the early 90s to basically commit my, my time and, and my intellectual capacity to working on the internet um, are very much the same things that are kind of driving me in in this area of, of crypto. So, um, you know, I, I got involved in working with the internet back in 1990, and uh, I was in college, and I, I was basically studying uh, political science, economics, philosophy, and was in particular looking at kind of comparative political and economic systems, kind of international macro and monetary um, c- c- comparisons. And was in particular, like, you know, right at the time in the early 90s, the Soviet Union was collapsing. And I um, was fascinated by that. I was fascinated by these different, like, structures, social and economic structures. And what what was really interesting is in 1990, the internet actually already had global reach. Um, it was used by research institutions, academic institutions, as a way to share scientific knowledge. And in fact, the first web browser, the CERN web browser that Tim Berners-Lee created at the CERN, you know, the particle physics laboratory in, in Switzerland, was, you know, a basically designed to hyperlink knowledge, right? Hyperlink different um articles basically by physicists and similar type folks. 
And but in any case, like the the early connectivity, the internet was there, and what I um, kind of discovered was the power of open networks that were able to disintermediate traditional forms of um, intermediaries, in in particular in the areas of media and communications. And I was able to, you know, I remember vividly, you know, in like 1991, communicating with and reading the equivalent of what is what we'd call citizen journalism now of people who were documenting what was happening as kind of tanks rolled through their neighborhoods and as, you know, these sort of revolutions um, happened throughout that area. And that to me was just profound. Um, It was really profound that there was a network and I fully understood, like, basically, this is just a set of open protocols that that are permissionless, that if you have a computer that can connect to this, then you can connect over these open protocols. And, and there were a whole host of protocols at the time, some of which were are still very much used today, like SMTP for email or or um, you know FTP or things like that. Um, there was no web, um, but all of this got me really excited. And um, you know, as as I graduated college it really became clear, like this was where I wanted to commit myself. So I started working on different ways, thinking about different ways you could apply the internet for media. And, um, and then, you know, basically in, in 1993, when the first graphical web browser was put out, um, by NCSA, the supercomputing, um, application, uh, you know, research area in, in, uh, Illinois, um, mosaic, uh, I, you know, very much became um, enamored that, you know, what, what we were was sort of seeing was the birth of a new, like, operating system layer for content and applications um, that people could build on, but that it would be open and global and anyone could connect to it and publish in it. And you could kind of see out on the horizon how, um, you know, connectivity to this network would grow and how transformative that would be. And that led me into, you know, collaborating closely with um, my brother, college friends, others in the founding of our first company, Alaire Corporation, which basically in in 1995, if you wanted to build like an interactive, uh, you know, transactional application that you could access through a browser, it was painfully difficult to do that. There weren't really app servers. Um, there weren't really programming languages that were well suited to people building in HTML. And so that's how, um, that's what led to the development of, of cold fusion, which is the first product that I helped work on, which was a web programming language. And, and the first, what we now call a commercial app server, where you could basically connect, you could write code on a server and connect to a database and then you could use that code on the server to kind of dynamically generate UI and, and, and UX that would be displayed in HTML and respond to user inputs in a browser. But the idea was basically anyone with $1,000 and an idea could create a global online service. And that was going to be this democratization of online services and software. And eventually you could you know, replace desktop software and, and put that you know, out through browsers. And so that, that was the first business and it grew into a, into a business. We had millions of developers using our products, um, you know, the leading HTML development tool of the time, um, you know, app servers for both high end like Java developers and, and more scripting type developers and content management systems, a lot of different stuff. That was a public company that we, um, we, we grew it and were public for a couple of years and then merged into a larger internet software firm, Macromedia, where I became CTO and worked on um, a lot of different things. We had a lot of different products, but you know that that combined business was basically like pretty much the primary tools that people use to create content on the internet, to author content on the internet, and then with Flash and Flash Player. We, we basically built in all of the underlying primitives that were needed to do really rich media and communications applications in browsers. And that was in 2002. Um, and that you know led into uh, my excitement about video and basically video becoming a, a native data type on the 
the surface of the internet that anyone could program and build on. And that led to my next company. Um, I, I left and incubated it at a VC and started Brightcove, which is a, is a publicly traded company now, which I founded and, um, you know, powers, you know, thousands and thousands of different media companies and brands and others sort of online television and, and video. Um, but uh, th that's a little bit of the backdrop in terms of the work that I've done coming up to uh, Circle. That's really interesting. And I know that many people probably draw parallels between the crypto cycle to the dot com boom. I don't know if you'd agree with that. But if you were to compare the two cycles, given that you've seen both of them play out, where would you say we are today in, in the crypto cycle relative to, say, the dot com boom? Yeah, I mean, in, in many, I mean, there, there are some similarities and then there are some really big differences. I mean, you know, what's notable is that in some ways, right, the, the infrastructure we have on the internet is so much more advanced now. So when you, when you look at like the ability for, you know, digital exchanges and, and, and various types of, of crypto projects and, and digital assets to kind of proliferate um, and be used, like it, it can happen on a rapidly, uh, a much more rapid scale um, and global reach. But, you know, back in um, 1997, you know, 1998, the, the actual connectivity of the Internet was pretty limited. If you go back and look at the percentage of people who were connected to the Internet, um, the percentage of the people who were connected to the Internet, you know, that were on anything but a dial up modem. I mean, it was very it was like thin pipes. The software really was not great for building good experiences. And so, um you know, it, it, it was not it was not going into global distribution, although people were getting connected to it and people were getting very excited about it. And people were coming up with ideas for how to transform, you know, this or that or whatever idea in industry. And so there was a lot of hype and a lot of capital, not totally dissimilar from 2017. Um, I would say, you know, one uh, one key difference was that, you know, the in the dot com boom, a lot of the ideas um, were, were, you know, reasonably well anchored in products that people could start to use as consumers, right? Like Yahoo was a usable product. Um, the first search engines were usable products by the average person. Web email um, was a usable product. Uh, you know, in that time, you know, e-commerce e marketplaces like eBay, the first versions of Amazon, even though the dot com cycle created, um, you know, a number, an, an enormous number, whatever it was, ninety nine percent of businesses that were not successful, there were some really successful businesses that touched mainstream users, and I think, um, you know, we haven't quite gotten there yet. We're getting really close in crypto, um, but I think that's one really key difference is that there's still um, there's still some usability um, and, and other kind of um, constraints around, uh, you know, using public chains for financial applications in a mainstream context. Um, we're getting really, really close, I think. Um, but um, there's just some things that haven't been solved um, yet or are in the process of being solved, uh, which can unlock it so that hundreds of millions of people can enjoy the benefits really effortlessly. And I think that's an amazing segue because my understanding is that is a huge mission pillar for Circle. So I'm sure most listeners of the show know exactly what Circle is, what the company does today. But for maybe the five of us who are not familiar, can you maybe give us a brief intro about Circle and what you guys are focusing on today? Yeah, sure. So um, as noted, I, I co-founded Circle in... Um, early 2013 with Sean Neville. And we, um, we were really excited back then about the idea that um, effectively that you could uh, take what we think of as traditional money, i.e. the liabilities of a central bank, like a dollar for a major reserve currency, and you could represent that as digital currency and you could run it and transact it over public networks, over public protocols in the same way that we can exchange content and data on the web and other internet protocols. And we're very, very interested in, in, in realizing that set of ideas. 
Um, we, we, over the years, you know, experimented with consumer products. Um, we ended up building a very uh, storied uh, crypto trading business. Uh, we acquired and sold an exchange, we, a number of different things over the years. But the core thing that we focused on was how do we create the infrastructure to enable, you know, essentially fiat to work as digital currency. And um, that involved, you know, uh, you know, b- building what is essentially like a new kind of, of what I call transaction banking platform, getting all the licenses and and working with regulators to get them comfortable with the idea that we could sort of sit at this intersection between the existing financial system and public chains. So did a lot of work, you know, uh, you know, building that out. And then finally in, in 2017, you know, I think in, in particular with Ethereum kind of being what I would call back then kind of production beta, uh, you know, ready, um, we saw that we could, we could actually start building, expressions of fiat transaction protocols on on public networks and that led to the creation of usdc um, and the formation of center consortium as a governance um, body for usdc that could provide assurances around uh, reserves compliance um, information security um, and you know kind of auditability which is really important when you're building you know, something like a, a trusted gateway to, to fiat um, in digital currency. And um, and then introduced that uh, over two years ago, um, over the summer and fall of 2018. And that's really defined a lot of what we're working on since then. I mean, USDC has grown really significantly as a stable coin. I think yesterday became one of the 10 largest digital currencies in the world by market cap and has grown a lot. And really now Circle has taken that core um, kind of leadership role in establishing USDC. And we've built out a broader family of um, accounts and API products for businesses and developers who want to connect um, this kind of world of the existing financial system with stable coins and do that in really, really powerful um, and seamless ways. And so those are services that we offer to, you know, um, just you know, blockchain-based businesses that just want to have an account that uses USDC to developers that want to integrate this and integrate things like traditional Rails with stablecoins um, in their own in their own products and services, which is growing a lot. Yeah, I do think that USDC and stablecoins are one of the most consequential innovations on crypto. I remember when they first came out, everyone's like, oh, this is boring. This is not Bitcoin. This is just using the same old monetary policy of you know existing fiat currencies. Yeah. But then it's obvious that most of the trading now is actually denominated in USD. And it made a lot of things a lot easier, even for me as an investor. And we're going to come back to the point about regulation and kind of straddling between the world of decentralization and compliance. But as you mentioned, uh, USDC's adoption is insanely impressive today. There's over $3 billion worth minted. And I think just yesterday, there's $400 million traded. So for those who are not familiar with crypto businesses, how would you kind of contextualize those numbers, right? What, what do we benchmark that to? Are we comparing this to kind of PayPal volumes? Or how do we understand the scope of USDC today? Yeah, I mean, we, we look at a lot of different things. So, I mean, there, there are many me- metrics that, that we look at. I mean, they're sort of... I think um, now it's 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 like six or seven billion has been issued, but the beautiful thing is that you know I think like four million has been redeemed. The point of this is that this isn't just a you know it's like I call the Roach Motel where you can you can get in but you can't get out. <laughs> you know what we what we really wanted to build is a reliable set of of rails that. Um, you know, businesses could get into and retail, you know, individuals could get into um, through Circle and Coinbase initially, um, where it's it's very easy to convert at no cost into USDC and to redeem at no cost into dollars into existing banking infrastructure. And, um, you know, ideally, what we ultimately want is we want people to stay sticky uh, and kind of, as we say, upload your dollars to the Internet and leave them there. Um uh, but um, there's been a, there's been a huge amount, and and the fact that it works that way that if I'm an investor or I'm a business um, accepting a payment using this rail that I can know that 
it, I can safely and easily um, redeem um, at will, you know, more or less 24-7 um, in, into uh, the existing banking system is super, super powerful. Um, now, the, the, the total issuance is one measure. I mean, when, when we walked into this year, you know, kind of pre-pandemic, so like February, early March, um, in, in terms of general awareness, there was like 400 million USDC in circulation. And now there's basically 3 billion USDC in circulation. And that's really significant growth. The, the other really notable thing is the amount of transaction volume that's happening on chain. So not, you know, trading volume on exchanges, which is obviously you just gave a, a statistic on that. It's significant. But the on-chain transaction volume, I think now life to date is you know, approaching $180 billion of tra transaction volume on chain. Wow. $150 billion of that has been since March of this year. Um, so it's, it's really, really grown. And that's really powerful because effectively, you know, we now have, there's an, an open API for dollars on the internet. Um, that's, that is, you know, uh, that works that you can connect to as a business or an individual that developers can integrate. And that's explained a lot of its success is that, um, because it's trusted, audited, reliable, and it's redeemable and it works. Developers have really wanted to use it in their own products and services. And so from very early on, when we started the project, um, we were very keen to you know, collaborate with emerging DeFi projects back in 2018 when some of them were just getting started and just were, were white papers, right? And, um, and, and then through, you know, through last year, as some of them kind of first kind of lit up and people could start to use them and there was total value locked. That was, that was um, relatively small, but interesting. And then this year, obviously, there's been this incredible growth in decentralized finance, maturation in these composable protocols. And that, you know, that, that, that you know, has really, you know, USDC has sort of um, kind of grown with that uh, very, very organically. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, that, that's been a, a fascinating part of the growth. But those are some of the metrics basically that that we look at. I mean, I think we we lost track of the number of projects, applications, or other things that integrate USDC in some way. I mean, it probably is in the thousands now. Um, but um, we've, we've started to get a repository where people can update, uh, make pull requests to add, you know, something if they have a product or or, or service that they're using uh, that that's using USDC just to to sort of publish it there. But it, it's grown a lot in terms of people who integrate it and develop on it. And, you know, a lot of in the, in the financial world and the fintech world, people talk about open banking, which is sort of this idea that, you know, banks would have a standard API where you could get authentication and data and, and maybe move funds. They have something like that in Europe. Um, I mean, I, I think things like stable coins on public chains are like the ultimate open banking. It's real open banking. <laughs> um, but um, yeah. That's fascinating. And I love that you mentioned that life to date, there's $180 billion worth transacted on chain. And over 80% of that is since March of this year. And there, USDC is obviously not the only stable coins. There are a lot of attempts at stable coins. I think Paxos tried something, True USD tried something. But what made USDC so successful relative to you know a lot of the attempts at launching stable coins? What were some of the tactics that you used earlier on? Who are the, some of the people that you targeted to bootstrap the user base from day one? Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's a couple of really significant things. Um, I think the first is the you know the approach we we took and are still taking very much is grounded in a philosophy of establishing industry standards. And establishing, um, you know, multi-stakeholder models for these standards. You know, all of the, you know, really large-scale things in, in many respects that that have happened on the internet are because there are standards and interoperability. Even in the financial world, you know, the things like what we think of and take for granted as "quote unquote" electronic money like the SWIFT messaging system or the ACH system or the card networks, right? These are all the kind of predecessor forms of electronic money. 
Um, they're all basically, you know, associations of collaborating private sector institutions, establishing technical standards for interoperability. That's what they are at the core. And then there's governance, right? Because you're, you're, there's liability and other things that go along with this. So when we started work, and, and it gets back to the vision of the company, like we believe very, very strongly that there needs to be an HTTP for money. There needs to be a protocol that can be consistently applied for fiat currency transactions that happen on public networks. So center consortium is that's the, the core is that we started a consortium and we, and which is center consortium center, the British spelling dot IO. And, um, and we invited Coinbase to join us who were very excited about the same, the same shared vision, right? I think that was really key is that we, wanted to work on something that was multi-issuer that, um, you know, that could evolve into a broader standard that eventually where there could be um, even dozens of different issuers uh, and, and dozens of issuers, not just of dollar digital currencies, but of other fiat digital currencies and, and really st- establish a, a, a network um, uh, that, that could govern that and grow that. So we're, we're still, in the first stages of that. Um, And we're having a lot of success. But at the end of the day, what that translated to was people looked at USDC as um, as something that, you know, had had kind of a a broader purpose than just being a single company thing. And, um, you know, obviously having liquidity and convertibility on Coinbase is really helpful. Um, you know, Circle, you know, was really key as well because we have very, very strong institutional roots and our ability to effectively make it a, a popular um, cryptocurrency within the trading markets was from a kind of bootstrapping perspective, really, really important. And then, yeah, I mean, I think getting focused on the on DeFi projects um, was really key. And other choices like, you know, there's no fees. There's no fees to create it. There's no fees to redeem it. Um, making it really easy to do those things um, re- really helped a lot as well. And then, you know, the consistency of of the accountability on it and the, and the audits and stuff has been really significant too. And this 30-second intermission is brought to you by our sponsor, Nexo. Depending on what type of company you're operating, Nexo can help you in different ways. As an exchange, they can be a strategic partner. As a miner, they will offer you OTC credit lines to help cover expenses. And as a crypto fund or any type of institutional counterparties, they can offer you a portfolio of structured financial products and up to 8% annual interest on your idle stable coins, as well as asset swap agreements or direct borrowing off crypto. Individuals can also park their cash and stable coins at Nexo's interest earning account to get an annual rate of 8%. And what's more is that you can actually claim this interest every single day, and you can add or withdraw funds at any time as well. So if this sounds interesting to you, get started at Nexo.io. That's really interesting. And I think that that's probably what sets aside experienced CEOs like yourself and a lot of the newer founders that I often come across when I look into venture investments. There's a lot of kind of build it and they'll come type of mentality versus what you said, kind of setting that foundation, setting those standards for the industry. So I think that's an important point. And another thing that I wanted to discuss was also this part, this point about decentralization and trustlessness versus regulatory compliance. And I don't know if you would agree, but to a certain extent, I almost see this as the battle between, say, USDC, which is more kind of construed as more compliant and kind of more by the book versus something like USDT, which is kind of more out there, you know, a li- maybe a little less trustworthy um, for more kind of institutional users, but traders seem to love it. So how do you kind of balance it to how do you balancing how do you balance between the philosophy of decentralization and trustlessness versus playing by the books and complying with regulators yeah and I, you know just to be clear um, you know USDT is is not decentralized and trustless at all um, and in fact it's more centralized than USDC and you know people make comments about things like um, blacklisting or mm-hmm. seizing addresses I mean they've I think done hundreds hundreds of examples of that where where they've done it Whereas Center has a extremely strict policy um, around around things like blacklisting, which is public and transparent, 
Um, so, uh, you know, just to be clear, I, I don't view the distinction between USDC and USDT as one between like permissionless, trustless. And uh, I think one is, you know, uh, effectively uh, avoiding uh, regulation um, mm. and, and operating in an opaque capacity. Um, and, and those are features like I think certain customers value um, things that are opaque and, um, and are, are trying to be outside the law. That's just a, that's a feature, not a bug for, for some people. Um, mm -hmm. That's very different than being trustless and decentralized. <laughs> um, and so that's just a key, key point I think to make. Um, right. But I, I do think the, the, um, you know, the, the broader point here is there is this line to straddle, which is how do you build something that, um, you know, can interact with the, the global financial system and also um, participate in the fundamental innovation of public chains. And that's, you know, that's been like the core, uh, the core kind of um, line that we've been trying to walk for seven years. And frankly, you know, really working tirelessly with regulators and with, you know, frankly, all the other fiduciaries that we have to get on board to do what we do, which is public accounting firms, insurance companies, uh, uh, you know, banks and card networks and it, all of the existing major players in the, the operation of the financial system. Like we've needed to get on board with this idea that we could safely provide a way to um, enable fiat digital currency to to work on on public networks and that is like that is an ongoing a major ongoing undertaking and i think the bigger the bigger picture here is that we see absolutely incredible opportunities in defi and for what it can do to bring um, financial market and financial product access to billions of people around the world. And we think it's very, very transformative. And we're deeply committed to making sure that, you know, the, the stable coins and protocols and other things that we work on can be really key composable building blocks in, in those ecosystems. And, but there are hard problems to solve. Um, and what's happening right now is, that you know, because of of the success of some of these things, and because of you know government initiatives like DCEP, uh, because of private sector initiatives like Libra, the attention on you know essentially the rule sets for how fiat digital currency are going to work in the world at the highest levels of of the governance of the international monetary system is very much in play right now. Which is it's incredible just to even see that that's the case. We expected that probably within 10 years when we started the company. And it's sort of that part, the level of engagement at the supranational level amongst the people who govern the international monetary system. Um, that's happening faster than I had originally expected. But the bottom line is like we need to find a way to enable these you know, digital cash like financial instruments to be composable and programmable and get the benefits of that. Um, and it's, this is not, you know, go put your head in the sand and hope that regulators aren't going to come, right? That, that is not the case. Right now, policymakers in the G20 and by definition, almost all of the world are rolling out comprehensive regulatory frameworks around stablecoins. And that is going to be the case. The, the, the key thing for industry, whether it's folks in DeFi or stablecoins or public chain infrastructure, layer one infrastructure itself, is to really ensure that um, we're building amazing value for people. Because at the end of the day, like society, if they're seeing these incredible benefits, and by society, I mean not just like individuals and self-sovereign individuals, but also firms and, and commerce, if they're really seeing transformative impact from this, um, then I think policy can be adaptive and we can and we can embrace these open networks in ways that um, the, you know, kind of the existing regulators have it's sort of outside of their their um, sort of too much cognitive dissonance for them right now to even imagine a world of of uh, of free movement of value and programmable value and so on. 
Yeah, and thanks for clarifying my comment around USDT versus USDC. I think maybe what is a better way to ask that question is, do you see the USDC vision as being somewhat complementary or uh, somewhat almost conflicting of something like DAI, for instance, or even Bitcoin, which has, which doesn't use you know the monetary mm-hmm. policy of our existing fiat systems and is. Uh, kind of more on the decentralized front uh, compared to something like USDC? Or do you see kind of the two visions being almost complementary in some way? Yeah, I mean, I, I look at it, all of this as sort of on a spectrum. And, I, and I, I, you know, I'm not like a maximalist on any of this stuff. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm very... I'm very long on Bitcoin as a non-sovereign store of value and ultimately as a transacting currency. Um, I'm, I'm also really interested in... Um, you know, I'm very, very interested in synthetic, you know, uh, s- synthetic, you know, kind of um, stablecoin, you know, uh, uh, products as well. I think they're, it's an interesting experimental area. Um, I think, you know, each of these has a, a different role to play. And, um, and, and over the short, mid and long term, the, those roles will, will shift. I guess our, our, our focus, at least, is we know that... Um, you know, there are these tremendous benefits of being able to use a dollar or a euro or another currency as a digital currency. Um, we know that there are um, tremendous benefits that come from the, the, you know, kind of the ability to settle transactions on a public chain with incredible speed and cost efficiency. We know there's incredible benefits to programmability and what can be built around that. And just from a mainstream perspective, we think that you know, these sort of uh, fiat digital currencies in this form um, will very likely become like the fabric of interoperability for how money moves in the world in and connected to the mainstream financial system. Billions of people will, will use that in the coming years, we expect. And that's really important. And people want to be able to connect and interoperate and get the benefits of, of this technology but they also want to like buy cookies and milk and pay rent and pay their taxes and get paid by their employees and or employers. And, um, and so I think we're, we're trying to strike a balance there um, with, you know, building things that, you know, harness the fundamental technology power, but also kind of work with where the world is today. Um, and at the same time, looking forward, I mean, I think there's a sort of it's, it's everything's up for grabs um, uh, in, in the future. Um, and, you know, I, I'm interested in, you know, synthetic global digital currencies that are um, a, a mixture of, of different fiat digital currencies that potentially have various pegs or ratios to things like Bitcoin, um, a la the old gold standard. So I, I think there's a lot of you know, incredible monetary experimentation that can take place. But right now for us, we're just, we want to make this really practical and accessible and useful um, for mainstream adoption of the technology. And a little over a year ago, you made this statement to Congress where you mentioned being slightly concerned that America may not be at the forefront of crypto and that companies in Asia might have a head start now, obviously, one year later, now China is launching its own central bank digital currency. And you mentioned that at the supranational level, there are there's much more scrutiny over crypto right now. And obviously, a lot of US publicly listed companies are also buying Bitcoin. And that's excited a lot of people in the crypto space. So what are your thoughts lately on crypto in the West versus Asia? Do you think the US is catching up to Asia? Do you think they're going in kind of different directions? What are your general observations there? Yeah, it's been it's been really interesting. I mean, one thing that I've noticed is that over the course of of 2020 in particular, and in particular, very specifically, since the pandemic, um, there's been a much more, I think, favorable um, people. People have leaned in way more on the policy side into crypto in a positive way. Um, And I think you know, there's this phenomenon that, that took place and and it's real. Like, I mean, just look at, look at the usage of crypto and the usage of stable coins and other things in the world, like between March and now, right. It's been, it's been dramatic. And there's a bigger theme, which is this acceleration that's happening around the world towards new 
you know, fundamentally new technologies and this, you know, broader digitalization theme, which has obviously been going on for decades, but, you know, people talked about, you know, how this, this was like a leapfrog moment that the pandemic, you know, changed um, consumer behaviors, can, changed corporate behaviors. Um, and it, and it really did, I think, make everyone go, okay, we got to stop you know, looking at the old system and defending the old system and, um, and, and trying to make sure the new things conform to the old system and saying like, what is the new system that we're building as a planet, as a humanity? And I think that that has resonated with people. And so the, you know, if you, you know, they talk about favorability ratings in, in presidential candidates or political candidates, like, I think like the favorability ratings for crypto went up a lot this year. Um, and you can see that in the dialogue with with policymakers and regulators, much more openness um, to it. And so that's that's, I think, quite, quite positive. I think there's really been a shift. I think that um, some of it is um, a reaction to perceived, you know, whether it's China driving forward with its digital currency plans or Facebook driving forward with its digital currency plans, but just generally what's happening in these markets I think has has become um, more acceptable, and you've seen, you know, out of um, you know d- different regulators, even much more constructive, um, you know, approaches. The CFTC, uh, the Treasury Department itself, you know. So I I feel like it's been a big it's been a big change this year, certainly in the West. Absolutely, and. With the remaining time that we have, I'd love to kind of take a look forward into what's happening next for USDC and Circle, starting with the most recent kind of update. Now, USDC recently onboarded into Solana. So can you talk a little bit about why this is important? What does this mean for USDC? Yeah, absolutely. So as I talked about earlier, when we when we think about USDC, we think of it as a protocol. And, you know, just as I described earlier, right, HTTP as a protocol for information and data on the Internet um, is, is really amazing because you can kind of connect, you know, anyone can connect to it and, and make their content available uh, to any other browser or, or what have you. And that that's really key. And, you know, the the you know, protocols like HTTP are not tied to a single operating system, right? If, if you only could use the web, if you had a Windows machine and a Windows server, well, that, that really wouldn't be the web. And when we look at these you know, protocols for, for fiat digital currency, um, we really look at it very similarly. We think it's very important that your digital dollars should be cross-platform and that you, know, you should be able to utilize those um, across um, a variety of, of of underlying operating systems. And I look at, um, in particular, kind of second and third generation blockchains, in, in many cases, as essentially new operating system layers on the internet. And there's a lot of competition in that space right now. And the trilemma of sort of, you know, speed, you know, s- scale, security, um, that people have been trying to solve is, is a very real problem because we're when we, when we look at what it's been possible to build on second generation blockchains, and USDC is an example of something that could be built like that, we're really running up hard against the, you know, the, the, the real constraints of those runtimes. Uh, I think of them as runtimes. And it's, it's like the constraints of dial-up versus broadband. Like what you could do on the internet was really limited. That's actually a big part of what the dot-com crash was about is that the hype of what you could do with the internet outstripped the technical reality of like dial-up modems and people on personal computers. And so it really took an upgrading of the infrastructure in broadband, in mobile broadband, into smartphones, into other devices that unleashed a lot of the ideas that really people had. There's a similar kind of infrastructure upgrade that needs to happen for a billion people to use this on a daily basis. And when we look at fiat and we look at payment um, you know, transactions, whether it's in a, a commercial like peer-to-peer context or a business-to-business context or a capital markets context where you're trying to move value in a trade or with, with counterparties, like 
we need we need dramatically more um, you know reach. So earlier this year, Center Consortium again Circle and Coinbase together devised a multi-chain framework for USDC and began um, certifying and bringing USDC to more chains. We rolled out Algorand for USDC for Algorand. We announced USDC for Stellar. Um, and uh, and then, yeah, yeah, just recently we launched USDC for Solana, um, which we're very excited about because, you know, something like Solana, it brings... Um, what we think is a, a, a very, very compelling environment for developers that want to build, you know, not just DeFi, DeFi and CeFi applications that can scale um, to support tens or hundreds of millions of users and where a digital dollar can move at 350 milliseconds at a fraction of a penny um, and uh, where the, the people who want to write programs to interact with that can do that with, you know, a variety of, of programming languages. It's a, it's a really exciting development. And I think we'll see more of that from us. You're going to see USDC as a protocol on, on more, on more chains. And, um, you know, we're seeing specialization, we're seeing, you know, blockchains that are, you know, focused in certain enterprise areas, international areas, embedded device areas, different kinds of profiles. And again, we just we think that your your digital dollars should work in all those places. Absolutely. And just to close us off, what would you say are the most exciting things that you're looking out for for Circle in the coming years, and what should we be paying attention to? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, I, I would say a couple things. I mean, I think just one, just generally in terms of like looking at the infrastructure, I think the really big thing that we're looking um, towards is. Now that we're we're putting in place kind of you know versions of these of these rails that can scale, it's really seeing this connected up to the mainstream of the existing kind of f- fintech and payments ecosystem. So I think that's really you know the the PayPal Bitcoin news was I think really exciting. It sort of relates to that, but I think the the bigger theme of when when do protocols like USDC start getting integrated into payment apps that people use every day, and, and we start to really see the the benefits of global scale interoperability? So I'm hoping to see more things like that, and and then that translates into you know USDC as something that can be used more in a day to day payments context and and enable that. The the other corollary there is the like Circle itself. And we have a very, very ambitious set of services that we're rolling out for businesses. I mean, our vision here is that every internet business, which should be essentially every business, um, every internet business in the world should have a digital currency native business bank account. They should be using digital currency and stable coins as a core part of how they manage their working capital and their treasuries. They should be able to get yield on that. They should be able to integrate it in lots of different ways into their own web experiences and, 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 and economic relationships and really starting to push forward this idea that there's like a new banking infrastructure for businesses that's built natively um, on all this, all this infrastructure. So that's a big focus from Circle's perspective in terms of products and services that we think can deliver value for, for companies around the world. That's definitely exciting, Jeremy. So for people who want to stay up to date with exactly what you just talked about and with more updates, what are the best channels for them to follow? Yeah, you can um, you can follow us on Twitter at CirclePay. You can follow me on Twitter at JRLair. And you can go to Circle.com where we have tons of content, blogs, uh, podcasts, other stuff too. Awesome. Well, this has been a delight. I've learned a ton about USDC Circle and yourself. So thank you so much again for taking the time for coming on to the show, Jeremy. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you.